Well, uh, Bernardo, it's, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. You've been uh, given uh, the Henry Kellett Lecture at our fourth era Society World Congress. And uh, your topic was urinary output in the post-operative patient. Now, if I just start off with where, where my background is in all of this, is really when I was trained, I was told, you know, we have to have a certain output all the time on these patients. And if we didn't, we were gonna have to give them boluses of fluid and then uh, Lasix and all this, uh, you know, to make the urine get going again. Now you, you, you don't believe in that. I think, you know, the data that's accumulated over the last 20 years does not support the view that we can do that and achieve anything meaningful. And that would be a little bit sad that we were doing unnecessary things and not achieving anything. But there is unfortunately more to it. And that is the problem that fluid loading in response to oliguria doesn't come freely or free of consequences. But isn't that what just about every textbook or every teacher is telling their uh, students yeah. today around the world? Yeah, I think that's true. I think uh, the majority of centers will respond to a lower urinary output, even in a patient who's otherwise quite okay, uh, by some kind of action. And the most common action is the administration of a fluid bolus. And, uh, you know, that can be up to 500 mils or up to a liter of fluid being given over a short period of time without really any evidence that it achieves anything in terms of kidney function or even increasing the urinary output, which is the ultimate target for this kind of intervention. So a lot of activity, no achievement, and some danger. And I think it's time to challenge that kind of position. I think we've got to the point that it's time to challenge it, and challenge it informally. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, I think that's what enhanced recovery is really all about. We're trying yeah. to challenge these dogmas continuously. Yeah. And this, this is one of the most strongest routines in post-operative care worldwide, isn't it? I think so, I really do, yeah. I really do. Certainly, it's true in Australia where it works very, very common, very, very yeah. common. Yeah. So, yeah. if we can uh, improve the response to that kind of uh, physiological situation, uh, we would have done something useful. And I think the first thing to ask ourselves is, is there any purpose in measuring urinary output routinely Right. In all patients, I mean, yeah. for example, colorectal surgery. Yeah. Is this a good thing to do? And if we didn't measure it, what would the world look like? Would it be a better world for patients or not? Uh, we don't really know because no one's actually tested it. But there's plenty of reason for believing that it would be a better world. You know, tell me a little bit about the normal reaction of the kidney to injury. Yes. Yeah. That must have something to do with it. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, it is a primeval mammalian response to injury to retain water and sodium. It's uh, a response to physiological stress. It's present in all mammal species. And of course, surgery is a form of significant physiological stress. So, in a sense, if the patient did not have oliguria, they would be abnormal. You have to worry that they're yeah. not having it. Yeah. Uh, and so you are treating the normal as abnormal. And then you're responding to something that is physiological with all sorts of crazy interventions. So it's a real problem. Well, we've been noticing as we've been implementing uh, enhanced recovery and training other units in well, just about across the world. We're asking them to weigh their patients, preoperatively and postoperatively, and obviously mostly in colorectal uh, surgery. We take out a, a big chunk of, uh, of, the, of, of the gut, which carries a lot of weight, and still they gain uh, well, somewhere between three and up to six kilos. That, that, is, that is true, and that's true almost for, for any surgery cardiac surgery, gastrointestinal surgery, orthopedic surgery, and again, some of it is the normal human response to physiological stress, which is to retain fluid and salt, but a significant proportion of that is aided 
and abetted yeah. by clinician behavior in the false belief that giving more fluid is going to be helpful in some strange way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. When you go into a little bit more detail around that, you find that some of it is actually uh, used during the operation. Yeah, that's but right. A lot is given in the post-operative care uh, unit, in the recovery rooms. That's right. And interestingly, even within the surgery, it's not clear what's the driving force to the administration of both a significant amount of fluid or fluid boluses. No one has actually studied it in the operating room. No one's actually looked at what it is that drives an institute to do this. And in the post-operative area, again, there is often a response to a mild degree of hypotension, which probably, again, is a physiological response to stress. Uh, and there is that kind of behavioral response, as we've discussed, to a low urinary output, which, again, is probably a highly preserved response to stress. So it's, it's kind of, from a philosophical point of view, uh, there is mammalian evolution, which has evolved over 130 million years to do something. And then the doctors who really understand very little of pathophysiology, thinking that they are smarter than 130 million years of evolution. Um, if you were a betting person, yeah. you probably would bet on the side of evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think many many clinicians uh, today, are, you know, they're looking at urinary output, they're looking at blood pressure, and when there's anything wrong with those two measurements, then you know, they give fluids. Yeah. Uh, any any particular fluids? Uh, I mean, that you would be especially worrisome in, in the use of. I, I think in 2016 uh, we should avoid artificial colloids. I think. We've got two large multicenter, randomized, double blind control studies for a total of almost 8,000 patients, both in two different jurisdictions, one in Scandinavia, one in Australia and New Zealand, both showing a significant increase in the need for dialysis. So you'd have to say that uh, there is no rationale for doing anything like that. It's dangerous. So starch containing fluids are really to be avoided. They cost 15 times more than crystalloids that have never been shown to have any benefit over crystalloids at a clinical level and they are toxic. So I think they should definitely be avoided. Whether we should move to balanced fluids uh, for everyone, uh, I think we will understand more in the next few years. The Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Society has been funded to do an 8,800 patients, multi-center, randomized, double-blind control trial comparing saline to plasma light, which is a balanced fluid. And I think that will give us a, a very large uh, body of data in uh, critically ill patients, but also post-operative patients. And then we will have a better idea of whether we should or should not move to balanced fluids for everyone. Coming back to the patient with the low blood pressure and uh, the poor urinary output, how should you, uh, how would you propose that uh, people react to something like that? That That's situation, true. I think yeah. it happens daily. Yeah, it happens all the time. And I, and I think, you know, there isn't going to be a recipe that fits every patient. And if you've got, you know, an 81-year-old person who has carotid artery disease, the diabetic, and normally hypertensive, having a blood pressure of 85, 90 systolic is probably dangerous, statistically. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to correct it. But if you want to correct blood pressure, then you have to use a vasoconstrictive drug. And uh, if you give fluids, you'll have a short-lived minor effect, and that will dissipate. And then what are you going to do? Yeah, so, I, you, you mentioned in your talk that the effect is there for about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. this is just out in the May issue of Critical Care Medicine. Yeah very tightly controlled environment, bolus of crystalloid, with data every minute. And which, uh, how, what was the bolus? This was 250 mils bolus. But let's say you're going to give 500 mils. Yeah. Okay, maybe it, was, it will last 20 minutes. Yeah. But, but, but you know, this is not yeah. 
going to fix the blood pressure this evening or in the middle of the night. And so you really have to use a basic constrictive agent. Uh, obviously, you have to practice good medicine. If the person is hypotensive, you've also got to ask yourself why. Yeah. You know, is the patient bleeding? Is the patient developing infection? Uh, and it may be the patient is also potentially dehydrated for reasons that you don't know. They might have had significant diarrhea for the previous day or two. And it, you cannot abrogate the duty of being a careful, thoughtful, deliberate, attentive clinician. That, that cannot ever be forgotten. So you have to do that. Yeah. But assuming for a moment that there isn't any obvious problem of that kind, the response in that patient would be to use a vasoconstrictive agent for the necessary period of time until the patient's inflammatory state is resolved. We, uh, what about drinking? Yeah, drinking is a good idea. Uh, you know, I think it, it has been forgotten or ignored or, or kind of felt to be dangerous for, again, physiologically really difficult to believe reasons. You know, in gastrointestinal surgery, uh, there is this perception that the anastomosis is at risk. Yeah. But the amount of secretions that would reach a colonic anastomosis every day by themselves is of the order of 1.5 liters. No patient after surgery would drink that much anyway on, on day one. They just don't feel that way. So again, it's, yeah. it's kind of a strange setup which has been passed on from generation to generation. I think that uh, one of the, the main challenges that we have in medicine is, is to help the medical community to be the best in the world to make changes, actually. That's right. There will be, because there's nothing more important. I agree. <laughs> The, on, the only thing that never changes is that you need to change. Yeah. <laughs> so one, one of the things that you mentioned was that if you give fluids to a post-operative patient, that may actually reduce the uh, urine production. Well, well, that, 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 that's right. I mean, you can have a significant amount of organ edema, particularly of the kidney. And the kidney is a capsulated organ. And if you have swelling of the kidney within the capsular space, then you have a kind of physiological equivalent of tamponade, where the kidney is swelling up, being squashed by the capsule, the pressure inside the organ goes up, and for an equivalent and same perfusion pressure, or mean arterial pressure, the actual organ perfusion pressure goes down because the resistance goes up. So you might be doing the opposite of what you're hoping to achieve. So it's a real danger. It's a real danger. Mm. I think that's a big eye opener for many people because everybody would think that you give a, a bonus, then of course it goes through the kidneys. Um, okay, that was that was one point I really wanted to, mm -hmm. to, to have come across. Um, I think it's important to talk about gut edema. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the ERAS work has been focused on colorectal surgery and rightly so, it's a very common and significant surgery. Um, and other surgeries that manipulate the gut. And in all the surgeries that manipulate the gut, there is a great desire for the gut to function. Yeah. And there's a great desire for the gut to decompress itself. And that is typically focused on trying to avoid or minimize opioids, uh, possibly mobilize the patient so that gravity will help. Now, possibly chewing gum to increase gastrointestinal motility. But, but another area that I think is important is to avoid edema of the gut. Absolutely. And yeah. if you've got a gut that's been manipulated, it's been bruised, and then you give a lot of fluid, it's already going to be prone to swelling because of actual physical manipulation related injury. Then on top of it, you give fluid, then it's going to swell up, and if it swells up, the actin and myosin fibrils will not be able to connect in a normal way and it stands to reason that you will have a greater risk of alias. And of course, if there is edema at the site of the anastomosis where there is the greatest degree of injury, 
then that might be responsible for micro leakage. Mm -hmm. If there is micro leakage, then there is infection of the anastomotic area. And if there is infection of the anastomotic area, there is a greater risk of alias and potentially of a more macroscopic leak. Yeah. So they're all connected. And I think attention to fluid management and avoidance of fluid overload is a really important way to help avoid and prevent these complications. Absolutely, I think you're, that's uh, one of the main targets and one of the things that we see very often in uh, yeah. surgical practice. Yeah. Is there anything I've forgotten that we should talk about? Um, uh, well, you're going to be speaking about diabetes. Maybe a few words about that. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, okay, let's yeah. take that as a yeah. start. Well, uh, we do a lot of surgeries on patients with disturbed glucose metabolism, pre-diabetics, diabetics, yeah. and Different, different levels of severity. And that's another one of your So you know, this is a, a really quite tricky area, um, and it's an evolving area. As, as you're quite correctly pointing out, uh, at least uh, in Australia, but I'm sure elsewhere, about 22 to 24% of patients who are admitted to the ICU or admitted to the hospital for surgery are diabetic. Uh, they might be on uh, oral diabetic medications. About 20% of that 20% are on insulin, uh, even though they are type 2 diabetics. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them have significant uh, glycemic control problems before the operation. Yeah. So that's not a surprise. That's not a surprise. We all, we all know that. But what might be of interest to people in the ERAS world is that it looks like the way in which diabetes is controlled or not controlled has a relationship with the way glycemia plays out in the acute setting, such that if you have poor diabetic control before coming into hospital, as assessed by your hemoglobin A1C, you have a significantly uh, increased association with mortality if your glucose is normalized. So that in patients that have chronic hyperglycemia, tighter glucose control in the ICU is associated with greater risk of death, as opposed to letting the patient sit where they normally sit. And this suggests all sorts of ways of thinking about this unique population. They need to measure hemoglobin A1C before they are admitted. They need to assess what their normal glycemic control is. And they need to potentially personalize or adjust the glycemic target in these patients according to what they are normally used to. And another emerging concept, which I will discuss this afternoon, is the concept of a relative hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that I mean that in diabetic patients that have got poor glycemic control, for example, in common A1C of 8 or 8.5, the normal glucose level is 10 to 12. In those patients, a glucose level of 6 which will be on the high level for you, is associated with neurohumoral changes, release of cortisol, release of noradrenaline, release of glucagon, and hypothalamic changes of MRI, suggestive of neuroglycopenia. So all of this stuff is happening without you realizing it. And certainly if the patient is in ICU when they're sedated and intubated, you just would not know this. And it is possible that this is another area that we should be thinking about and studying and intervening and potentially avoiding. And the message kind of comes back to, if you wish, the way the physiology of the body has been adjusted and adapted over a significant period of time chronically, mm -hmm. probably best not perturbed too quickly. Yeah. The focus has been on, until now, simple things, you stop drinking, yeah. you stop smoking, 
you know, and, and yeah. you know, psychological preparation. They're all important, don't get me wrong. But there is now an additional need to think about other aspects and better metabolic control before coming into hospital may be an important dimension of prehabilitation, including better glycemic control, better um, management of physical activity, yeah. uh, which in itself would then have an effect on your metabolic control. And so this is a completely, really new area of, of ERAS, in yeah. a sense, yeah. Yeah. before the operation. Yeah. That, that has not been the focus of attention until recently. That's right. And it's really, it is, it's, it's, really it, it's really got lots of dimensions, yeah. psychological, yeah. social, physical, metabolic, removal of toxins such as cigarettes and alcohol. All of those are elements that are typically often dismissed. Mm -hmm. or, and, and I think you do your patients a disservice if you don't actually try to tax it up. Makes a big difference. I mean, yeah, they tax away. So. Yeah, I know, but but yeah. often, no, but people don't do anything about it. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, we had uh, we covered a lot of things. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. That's and um, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be yeah. here. Yeah, that's great. Um, maybe I'll ask yeah. one more question. Yeah, sure. Think of it. Yeah. So this is your first uh, uh, encounter with uh, the Era Society yeah. and, the, yeah. and the meeting here. Yeah. Any particular impressions that you have? Well, a couple of things. Yeah. I think uh, this is uh, going to become a worldwide movement mm -hmm. over a period of time. I yeah. think the pressures in terms of hospital beds hospital resources, the cost of healthcare are immense. And if you're going to service an increasingly older and frail population, all of these concepts that we've talked about, prehabilitation, uh, ERAS at the time or surgery immediately afterwards, and then the rehabilitation after that are going to become crucial elements of an efficient healthcare system. And if we don't do that, uh, we will have lots of problems. We will have lots of problems. So and, I, and I think the other thing that's exciting for me, uh, watching uh, all the deliberations of the meeting, is that this is actually a concept that has started with surgery, but I think it's a universal concept. And I think over time, uh, we don't just need ERAS, but we need ERAD, which is early recovery after disease. Uh, all of the principles that we've discussed uh, and that you're trying to implement for surgery surely apply to an 80-year-old person coming with pneumonia, surely apply to a 65-year-old coming with a deep venous thrombosis. But they are the same principles and we are going to have to do it. Uh, and in fact, rather than have to do it, we should want to do it. And I, and I think uh, the third element is that the electronic communication system and the non-invasive monitoring systems that are now becoming available will make it possible for us to have somebody at home with literally a wristwatch measuring their vital signs for 10 or 15 minutes every six hours and Wi-Fi them across to a nurse in the hospital with a Skype communication to see the patient every day and that, that will be good for the patient. Yeah. And in fact, there are now programs that are developing, uh, certainly in the UK, where the concept of having a patient being deemed ready for discharge are being subverted to discharge to be ready, where you actually take the patient to the home yeah. and you assess after discharge if they are ready to stay at home. And the observation yeah. is that yeah. for a number of elderly patients who are confused in the hospital, yeah. coming home makes a colossal psychosocial difference. All of a sudden, instead of being lost in the corridor looking for the toilet and falling over and being sedated because they're delirious, they are at home where they know where the toilet is, yeah. where they know where the cup of coffee can be obtained, where they feel not scared, but comforted. 
all of this level of thinking needs to come into medicine, and it hasn't yet fully done so. So in my mind, this is a revolution, and this is the beginning of a revolution, and I think we need to push hard at every level because it is too important to let it go. Fantastic. Thank you.